So we're going to start today's lecture with section 15.4 in the book. So the, let's just make sure the volume is up here. The, um, that's the aromatic ions idea. So we've discussed in the previous lecture that in order for the specific species to be classified as aromatic, what you need is to have 4n plus 2 pi electrons. So let's write that down as our general rule, 4n plus 2 pi electrons. That's the general rule here in order for things to be aromatic. And the most common example of an aromatic compound is benzene. So let's draw that. And that's a case where it has 6 pi electrons in the system. So that's 4F fills the 4N plus 2 rule with N equals to 1. All right. But it turns out that there are a number of other species that can be aromatic as well. And the one that they talk about in section 15.4 of the textbook is the idea of an aromatic ion. Okay. So there are a number of cases where not neutral molecules, but these are charged molecules where they are cyclic and they have 4n plus 2 pi electrons in the system and those species are aromatic as well. So here's one that we talked about in class. This is the cyclopentadienyl anion. Okay, so in order to generate this species, we started with cyclopentadiene. So that's this structure. This is our favorite diene. And use a base to pull off the proton at the sp3 hybridized carbon. So let's draw that mechanism. And that base, what it does is it pulls off, hold on, so what that base does is it pulls off the proton on its saturated intermediate carbon, this guy here. You push the electrons in this bond into the ring to generate the cyclopentadienyl anion. And that anion now has, if we count the pi electrons, two from this double bond, two from that double bond, and two from the anion at this carbon center that can be involved in the pi system. And that makes this an aromatic anion. There are other examples as well of aromatic ions. So I'm just going to show one more here. This is a, maybe we'll do two more, cyclopropenyl cation. Okay, so let's put a positive charge here. This is an aromatic compound. an aromatic compound like this. And the reason I know it's aromatic is it has 4n plus 2 pi electrons. For the case of n equals to 0, OK? So that just means 2 pi electrons in the cyclic system. It's also cyclic. It's also made up entirely of sp2 hybridized atoms. So it fills all the other rules for aromaticity which is therefore how I know why this is an aromatic cationic system. There are other cases again as well. Let's do a, one more, I guess, just for fun. This is an interesting compound here, the one I'm showing you. It's the core of a set of dyes called squaring dyes. I'll write that for you. And this squaring die, this is a really interesting squaring die because it turns out that the most stable form of this core is a cyclobutane butene ring with a 2 plus charge on it. So in this case as well, this is a cyclobutene with a 2 plus charge. This is another case of a 4n plus 2 
aromatic system, again in this case, n equals to zero. So, and you can check in your book for other examples of aromatic cations and anions and their stability as well. I'm going to move on now to section 15.5 in the book. And section 15.5 talks about aromatic heterocycles. So pretty much everything we've talked about so far has all carbons in the ring structures, but there's really nothing that indicates that that has to be the case according to the theory of aromaticity. So I'm going to show you now two examples of aromatic compounds that do not contain only carbons, but they actually have these nitrogen heteroatoms in, their, in the backbone of the molecule. So this is pyridine here, and this one is pyrimidine. These two heterocycles, uh, just to answer the unasked questions, yes, you are responsible for nomenclature of all of these compounds that we discuss. And these are aromatic compounds for purposes of figuring out whether these are aromatic, we just count the six electrons in the double bond. So two, four, six uh, pi electrons means that's aromatic, and two, four, six. Again, I can count six pi electrons using the double bonds, the double bond electrons. Now, it turns out that in this case, the nitrogen, of course, has a lone pair of electrons on it. Let's see if we can figure out a good way to draw that in Kendra. We have a lone pair in that nitrogen. Nope, not like that. Hold on. Okay, good. Is that my lone pair? I don't even know. We have a lone pair over there and a lone pair over there. These lone pairs in this configuration are not involved in the pi system. So let's be clear because this can get confusing for people these lone pairs are not included in the pi system. That's because the geometry of these sp2 hybridized nitrogens means that the lone pairs are pointed out of the aromatic ring. Because, and the reason I know they're not included again is because nitrogen is sp2 hybridized, lone pair points outside the aromatic ring. So for purposes of figuring out whether these particular heterocycles are aromatic, I effectively ignore the lone pair on the nitrogen in my electron count. Now, there are also cases where we do not ignore the lone pair of, on the nitrogen, and those are for sp3 hybridized nitrogen atoms. Where, do, where can I not... ignore the lone pair on the nitrogens. Well, let's see what I can show you over here. Let's look at this five-membered system. Here, let's do another five-membered ring system here as well. So we're going to put some double bonds into these systems. And we are also going to put some nitrogens. Pick your favorite nitrogens. Look at here, nitrogen, nitrogen. And this is parole and imidazole. So let me draw the, write those names as well. It's always a good idea to know more nomenclature. Parole and imidazole. All right. And in these cases, the nitrogens that are sp3 hybridized, so these two, this one and this one, their lone pairs are able to participate in the conjugation in the aromatic ring such that when I count how many pi electrons I have in the system, I count those as two pi electrons. So for parole then, I'm going to have two pi electrons from this double bond, two pi electrons from this, and two from the lone pair in the nitrogen, and here also for the imidazole, two, two, two. So again, 
when the nitrogen is sp3 hybridized, the geometry around that atom allows the lone pair to be included in the conjugation. And again, let's zoom in on this imidazole for a second because this one is actually interesting. Imidazole has two different kinds of nitrogens in the molecule. It has this sp3 hybridized one, and we do include that lone pair in figuring out the total aromatic pi electron system. And it has this sp2 hybridized one, where here we do not actually include the lone pair on this nitrogen in the aromatic ring count. And again, the way I remember which ones are included and which ones are not is by looking at the hybridization around that heteroatom. So sp2 hybridized ones and lone pairs are not included. sp3 hybridized ones, lone pairs are included in this system. And there are a number of other examples of heteroaromatic hetero ring systems including what you're going to find in DNA. So the ba aromatic bases in DNA are actually all um, aromatic heterocycles. So let's draw those numbers. Cytosine, thymine, and uracil, for example. These are heteroaromatic structures. Hold on, we will draw those for you. So these are three examples of aromatic bases in DNA and RNA. So let's, for each of them, count the total number of aromatic electrons. So for cytosine, let's start. I have two and four from these two double bonds. I have the lone pair on this nitrogen. Okay, so that's six. And then this nitrogen, which is sp2 hybridized, its lone pair is oriented this way, so that's not going to count. So again, two, four, six here. For this case, I have one double bond, so that's two. And then both of these nitrogens are sp3 hybridized. So therefore, the lone pairs on both of them count. So I can count 2, 4, 6. That makes this one aromatic. And again, here for uracil, they're both sp3 hybridized. So their lone pairs participate in the aromatic ring. So again, I have 2, 4, 6 for the uracil as well. There are some other cases. Let's just do. Um, two other examples of heterocyclic aromatic compounds. So let's just do a few other examples of heterocyclic aromatic compounds. This is one histidine. This is an amino acid. I can count two, four, and then in this case, these two electrons, six pi electrons here. That makes this compound aromatic. Furin and thiophene are aromatic compounds. These are interesting because each of these atoms, the oxygen and the sulfur, they each have two lone pairs of electrons. And the way the geometry of these molecules works, one of the lone pairs is delocalized into the aromatic ring, and one of them is not included. So that's, that could be potentially confusing as well. So for purposes of oxygen and sulfur, count one of the two lone pairs for your aromatic ring um, pi electron count. There are, let's move on now, so that's as far as um, heterocyclic aromatic compounds go. Let's move on to section 15.6. This is polycyclic aromatic compounds. This is actually very interesting. So up until now we've been talking about ring systems that have only one aromatic ring in it. It turns out that structures with fused aromatic rings, they are also aromatic. They don't technically, they're not technically included in Huckel's rule, but let's do some, let's show you some examples of those structures here. Um, and these are really interesting compounds. They're interesting for a lot of reasons. Um, most interesting from my perspective as a chemistry researcher is that these are generally toxic carcinogenic compounds. Um, for from purposes of aromatic structure, we can look at these really as having a single extended pi electron cloud throughout the aromatic ring system. So you can imagine instead of having one pi ring 
cloud here. This is an extended one. This one's even more extended. And this guy, this benzo pyrene here, is going to be even more extended as well. One consequence of this extension of the pi system is that the UV vis absorption of these polycyclic aromatic compounds occurs at longer wavelengths. And this is something we talked about in the problem solving session on Friday, February 20th, that the longer, the more conjugation you have, the shorter the gap between the HOMO and the LUMO. A shortened HOMO-LUMO gap. And that that translates into a longer wavelength, i.e. a lower energy absorption. So benzopyrene, for example, we can see in the visible region. And when you start getting to really fused large structures, they start to look black even because we cannot see them in the, air, in the visible region because their absorption has been shifted so much to such a longer wavelength. And your book goes through, but I'll just show you a picture of it, how we can draw different resonance forms for each of these aromatic ring systems. So here I just want to show how all of these polycyclic aromatic compounds can be represented with a variety of different resonance forms. So I can draw naphthalene in this case. In this way I can also shift the pi electron system around, draw it like this, or like this. So naphthalene has three resonance forms. Again, the actual structure is really a compilation or an average of the different contributing resonance forms. But there are a number of ways in which you can present naphthalene. Something else that's interesting that I would like to address for a second is the stability of these compounds. So if I start with benzene and then go to naphthalene, anthracene, and tetracene, I'll write all those names as well, the stability of these molecules tends to decrease substantially. And that's because if we look at this compound, benzene has six pi electrons for six atoms. And I just count the number of pi electrons. Now for naphthalene, I have this six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I have ten pi, I have, sorry, six pi electrons for one benzene ring. One ring naphthalene, I have ten pi electrons for two benzene rings. Anthracene, I have 12 pi electrons for three benzene rings. So the amount of pi electrons per benzene ring decreases the more co fused conjugated stuff I put onto my molecule. And that leads to a substantial decrease in stability. such that, for example, tetracine is very difficult to work with and isolate. By the time you get to pentacene, you cannot actually make those compounds um, at room temperature. You have to take a lot of glove box air and moisture sensitive precautions for those particular cases. So that's as far as polycyclic aromatic compounds go. I want to talk briefly now. Let's move just to end this chapter in section 15.7, which is spectroscopy of aromatic compounds. And from here we can talk about a few different things. The first is the IR spectroscopy. Infrared spectroscopy of aromatic compounds gives you a number of different signals. But it's, you should be able to look at the region from about 690 to 900 wave numbers to be able to figure out or get a hint as to the substitution pattern. So region from 600 to 900 wave numbers provide inf provides information about the substitution pattern of that benzene ring. So let's just show an example of what that's. That's what we see over here, and this is from your book, where you can see this region 
um, between 690 to 900, you can actually see different characteristic signals depending on the substitution around the aromatic ring. So that's as far as IR spectra of these aromatic compounds. UV spectra, again, the more conjugated the system is, the longer the wavelength of UV absorption, but we talked about that already in the context of the polycyclic aromatic compounds. And then the, other, the next thing to think about would be the NMR spectra. And here, the proton NMR spectra is actually very interesting because of the aromatic ring current. The aromatic protons are deshielded. So if you're asking to yourself why these aromatic protons don't behave or show up in the, uh, in the NMR spectra right around where alkenes do, they, shift, they show up at higher ppm values, that's because the current in the aromatic ring makes the protons attached to that ring feel effectively a greater magnetic field than the actual applied ones. So aromatic ring current reinforces the magnetic field and that leads to deshielding. Now it's interesting to note, and your book goes through this as well, that this deshielding is true only in the case for protons that are pointed away from the ring versus if you had a case where the protons were actually oriented and pointed into the ring system, those would actually be substantially more shielded. It's really hard to think of an aromatic ring that has protons pointing inside into the interior of the ring, but I'm going to try to show you an example of that in just one second. So let's just go through. So these are pictures from your book. Here you can see the aromatic ring current leading to deshielding on these protons, these guys here. If you had an error, so that's what the blue guys in this case are all going to be deshielded. The red protons, the ones that are pointed here on the inside, those are actually highly shielded. They show up at negative 3 ppm. That's even more shielded than the TMS, which we've said nothing is more shielded than that. It turns out if you can get aromatic protons into the interior of the ring, those are actually going to be more shielded. And then the final note about proton NMR of aromatic rings is we can look at their position and their splitting in the aromatic region and always, always, always be able to figure out whether I have a para-substituted ring. So a comp system like this, we talked about this in the context of the proton NMR chapter, this kind of para-substitution always leads to two doublets in the aromatic region. Um, so that's, and again, the final note will be here that the carbon-13 NMR spectra, that one has pr uh, signals for aromatic rings, again, in a very clear and characteristic region. So that pretty much concludes Chapter 15, Benzene and Aromaticity in your textbook. Please refer to the problem set that I'm going to post online to be able to do practice problems related to this material. And on Monday, we'll pick up with uh, Chapter 16.